Welcome everyone. My name is Chad Smith and I'm a member of the District 10 Como Community Council. Uh, each year the Como Community Council puts on a number of Sunday presentations and this year's Sunday series uh, will run at 1 p.m. beginning today, running through March 27th. You can find the full schedule on our website, district10comopark.org, on our group's Facebook page or in our weekly newsletter. And I'll put a link to that schedule in the chat in just a few minutes. At the end of today's presentation, we'll use the remaining time to use a, do a question and answer session. And I do ask that everyone keep your microphones muted during the presentation to avoid accidentally disrupting it. And just a heads up, this pre uh, presentation is being recorded and it will be posted on our website, uh, hopefully later this week. So I get excited for the State Fair every year, so I've been looking forward to this presentation. Uh, I hope you have too. Uh, today's presenter is Jerry Hammer. He's the general manager of the Minnesota State Fair and a neighbor living right here in District 10. And today he'll share a little about the history of the State Fair and the fairgrounds, including buildings and attractions that no longer exist, as well as past cancellations of the fair and the impact of COVID on the event. So Jerry, we're happy to have you here today. Uh, the floor is all yours and you should also be able to share your screen whenever you need to. So go right ahead. Well, thanks very much, Chad. And hello, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to to be here, just a very little bit uh, about me. I grew up on Brita, uh, right between Winnie. And if you grew up in the neighborhood, you pronounce all the vowels. Uh, it's not Win, it's Winnie. Uh, it's not Chelsea, it's Chelsea. And it's Pascal, not Pascal, if you grew up. So that's, if it you know, sounds a little little different, that's that's how we do it. But anyway, I grew up on Brita. Uh, went to Holy Childhood Grade School, Creighton High School, and uh, St. Thomas College. It wasn't university just yet. My wife grew up on Canfield and Pascal, right across the street from uh, Lingblomston, uh, where my mom lives right now. And uh, uh, we lived on, uh, for a few years, we lived on Como right after we got married uh, in a duplex between Arona uh, and Pascal. And then we moved way north. Now we're on Huron between Nebraska and and Arlington. So uh, we never, literally never left the neighborhood. I started working at the fair when I was 15 in the greenhouse, great summer job, and it was a block from home. So it you know, couldn't be much better than that. And I just stayed at the fair. Uh, I, I graduated in, in journalism. I did spend a few months, I don't really count them because it wasn't long enough to count at a newspaper in Otana as a sports editor and, and a wire editor, <clears throat> but uh, then started back full-time with the fair in uh, 1977. I was a marketing guy for 18 years. And then uh, for the last, I'm in my 26th year now, as State Fair General Manager. So uh, it's been a real privilege to be able to stay so close to home with, with an event that actually is, is, uh, is world famous. And we'll get to that in a second. So I'm gonna, now I'm gonna attempt to do what all good Zoomies do, which is share screen okay. and go to some slides. There we go. Is everybody seeing a lineup of cows in a field? We sure can. Nice. Uh, I, I, I tell our staff and, and everybody, I said, if you want to know where you are, you've got to know where you've been. So all that institutional knowledge is so important uh, and, and just an idea of some history and how everything developed. But uh, a number of years ago, I was asked, again, I've been really, really fortunate. I was asked to do a presentation for the Royal Agricultural Society, the Commonwealth. And then actually I wound up doing a few, but uh, for this particular presentation, we were in York, England, I've never been to New York, but I have been to York uh, a couple of times. Uh, and uh, their idea, uh, when you get in uh, European agriculture shows, especially the, the elements are very much like ours, but uh, they're also very dissimilar. The long ones, they run three days. Most of them are single days. But this photo was taken at the uh, South of England show, uh, just south of London a little ways, very, very near, near Heathrow. And their idea, and, and if you if you Google fairs, you get the same the same uh, uh, photo. And I'm trying to get next picture. And I'm really sorry, it's not happening. How we advance, Matt? There we go. Thank you. It's always good to have technical help. Google fairs image, and you get Ferris wheels. And you get uh, lots of really dopey fried food. 
Uh, and these concessions actually do exist, not at our place, but, uh, but they do exist. And uh, this particular guy actually, believe it or not, sells chicken and he has all this other stuff. It's basically a, a come on, all this goofy fried food. Well, the reality is fares way more uh, than that. And, and there, there are people right living right here that, that have the same image. You know, it's, it's thrill rides and, and fried food, but it's so much more than that. And uh, our mission uh, and basically uh, North American agricultural fairs all start with uh, connecting people to where their food comes from. And I've actually had conversations with adults that, uh, that believe that the food is actually prepared and made in uh, the back of grocery stores. And that's really not true at all. Uh, so for many folks, uh, really the right now, based on curriculums in schools and elsewhere, the only, the only place they really have a chance to learn about where your food and fiber comes from is fairs. Uh, this particular exhibit uh, uh, designed for kids, but basically for everybody. And it's about, you know, egg and poultry production, uh, <clears throat> a lot of science involved in the fairs, certainly. And this is a show we've had for a number of years now out of uh, University of Delft in Canada uh, called Equimania. They uh, get, learn a lot about biology, all the rest. Uh, and there's, uh, uh, this photo was sent to me um, by someone who thought that it, they were really raising dairy cows now with a QR code on them. Uh, they're not, but it just, uh, it just highlights how technology is becoming more and more a part of, of what we do and part of our mission in education. And it goes beyond, way beyond agriculture. One of the most popular exhibits we have at the fair is uh, Alphabet Forest, uh, staffed by val volunteers. Uh, early learning uh, and um, also math is available up there. The, uh, the Alphabet Forest and Reading Program was so popular uh, that we uh, took it another step further with, uh, with uh, math uh, on a stick. Uh, a lot of folks love to attach on a stick because everything is at the fairs on a stick, not really, uh, but uh, that, that's a part of the, just the overall image of the fair. And then STEM, huge day at the fair with, uh, a lot of activities for kids uh, in, in every, every facet of, of STEM. Uh, also, uh, one of our, our newer exhibits at the fair, uh, actually it's been there for a number of years now, but it's in, it's in the oldest building on the fair, which is the Progress Center from 1907, and we'll take a look at that in a little bit. But uh, it's the Eco Experience, and uh, that exhibit's produced with uh, cooperation from the Minnesota uh, uh, pollution control agency and one of the most popular exhibits last few years was this one you know, what are we doing with water how do we protect it where does your water come from you know is it a river a lake underground whatever a lot of things that just uh, aren't normally thought of but uh, but big part of, of uh, what we do where they come from and uh, one of the uh, most important things they did one of the fun most fun things they did is they actually did flights of water uh, from different parts of the state so you can really taste uh, the differences just based on where the water comes from. Uh, but this exhibit is is extraordinary. This started, uh, we go back, now it's close to 10 years ago, but uh, a, a professor at the university was looking for uh, uh, test subjects for studies for all kinds of different things. His particular field was in, uh, was in a, a child uh, health and uh, just uh, looking at how kids grow, uh, how, how things happen over time. And he, he said the fair is a perfect place because you can come back and check in every year. They can collect a lot of important data. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, there's been hundreds of programs at, where the university through their Driven Discover program has uh, conducted research on everything. A lot of it's health related, but uh, much of it isn't. And there's been, uh, at this point, there's close to 60 uh, research papers written based on data collected at the fair. And what the university has told us uh, again and again is that uh, a lot of these tests, it'd be impossible uh, to conduct because they just have difficulty finding people that are willing to participate. When you go to the fair, it's a whole different story. At the fair, everybody wants to participate. So uh, this is a really important exhibit here and it's contributed quite a bit uh, to Minnesota and basically to, to society in general. And some of these tests, you know, have the, have the potential to affect uh, all of, you know, our, our whole world population. So it's a really important thing that, that we're doing here. Uh, health fair. 
Uh, it's produced by uh, Care 11, but there's there's a lot of different organizations that are involved in this. And, and we hear every year, uh, we'll hear from scores of people that say they uh, just stopped in for a blood pressure check, haven't been to the doctor in a while, and they and they found out that you know they've uh, they've uh, been in danger of heart attack or stroke uh, or uh, early check for diabetes. All of these things uh, happen at the fair, uh, and and it's it's real easy to walk in and get it all done in one place. You don't need an appointment. You don't need anything. So, so the, what we've heard again has been really really encouraging uh, and. Uh, from a lot of people that are grateful that this type of exhibit is at the fair. And uh, when, when you grow up next to something, you figure that's what everything is like. I thought all state fairs were like this uh, until I got just a little bit older. We were about, I was about, I was nine years old and we went by the uh, South Dakota State Fair in Huron and I expected it to look like our fairgrounds and it didn't. Well, this is a group here from the Royal Ag Society of the Commonwealth. Uh, represented in this group is England and Wales uh, and uh, Cornwall and Australia and New Zealand. And uh, they couldn't get over the fair and uh, the size of it and, and just everything that's, that, that becomes part of the fair with it. it was really extraordinary. And this particular group, uh, they were not here in uh, 21. We're hoping they'll be back in 22, but it's journalists from around the world. And my very good friend, you can see her. She's on the right in the front row with the hat on. She's really not that short. I think she was standing in a hole, but her name is Monique Linder and she coordinates this program through uh, the University of St. Thomas. And they spend about six weeks in the US, but they always start here in the Twin Cities and there's always a fair visit involved. And this particular group includes journalists from, uh, from England, from Nigeria, from um, uh, India, from Russia, uh, from literally all over the world. And it's really nice to host them and it also helps us uh, continue with our, our developing this perspective on just exactly what, what, what the fair means to folks and, uh, and, and how wide our, our, uh, our, our reaches. Uh, I was in, uh, uh, in Japan, my daughter was teaching English there. This was uh, 15 years ago now. And I was teaching English to uh, middle school kids and I had a state fair jacket on. Yeah, imagine that. And uh, uh, a, a Japanese gentleman, very good English. He, he knew about the fair and he actually been here. And, and he said, what you really need is a live butcher exhibit. I, you know, it, culturally, I don't know that that would really work all that well here. Um, but he was, uh, what was, what was amazing is I'm on the other side of the world and talking about what type of exhibits there might be at the, at the Minnesota State Fair. And the same thing happened again. Uh, I was in Australia doing a presentation on the fair. And uh, we were at, a, I suppose the equivalent would be like a, like a Super America slash deli slash farmer's market. And again, once again, I had a fair jacket on and the guy said, oh, St. Paul, oh, really? And not only did he know the fair, he knew what city it was in. I said, oh, have you been there? And he said, no, but his sister has. And she's still talking about it 10 years later. And when uh, this young man uh, planned on visiting the US, he was gonna do it while the state fair was on. So um, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it was really pretty humbling at the end of the day. Uh, to, to see that so many people uh, are, are aware of the fair and know about it. So, so now we know where we are. So now, now let's look where we've been. This is not uh, the guy from ZZ Top. And I, when, I, when I'm able to do this in front of, uh, when, when there's really people in the room, not Zoom, they always ask that being, you know, smart Alex, but no, his name is John Stevens. And uh, he, in 1854, uh, he's the guy that laid out Minneapolis. Uh, he said his greatest regret in life was that he, he had the streets line up with the uh, vagaries of a river and not north and south. Um, but he also uh, founded the Hennepin County Agricultural Society and the Minnesota Agricultural Society. Now at that time, Minnesota was a territory that was 1854 and he and, and others not people directly involved in agriculture, but more the support industries. So it was uh, uh, timber folks and, and railroad people and land speculators. Uh, they got together in 1854 
and formed the Minnesota Agricultural Society, which later became the uh, same organization. The state was attached to the name, but not initially. Minnesota didn't become a state until 1858. And it's the same organization today. So uh, uh, the, the state fair is actually older than the state itself. Uh, first territorial fair was 1855. It was known as the balloon fair. And you can see the balloon being inflated in the back. It was held near what became the state capital. You can see that wooden fence there. And back in those days, they decided to do a fair about three or four weeks ahead of time. Uh, and they didn't have time to put up fence all the way around. The fence was only on three sides. The fourth side was staffed by uh, some uh, very big, uh, scary looking guys with bulldogs. And apparently it worked. Uh, the balloon was uh, supposed to land in uh, around White Bear, White Bear Lake. Um, but as it came down, uh, there were three people aboard. Two of them jumped out. There went the ballast. So the balloon went back up again and uh, didn't uh, come down again until north of Forest Lake. But it, that was the first, the first flight, uh, lighter than air flight in Minnesota. Um, in 1858, when Minnesota became a state, there was a tariff, uh, there was not a fair that year. There was a financial panic that, that gripped the nation. So that was it. There wasn't any, um, any fair that year. 1859, there was a fair near downtown Minneapolis, which there's some evidence at least that, that the, the Ag Society wanted to ignore because this photo, which was taken in 1860, was at Fort Snelling. And that fair is referred to as the first uh, Minnesota State Fair, but they really curious. This is kind of curious. It, it, it's a big deal being admitted to the Union, and uh, they didn't attach state to the name until the late 1860s. It just was the Minnesota Fair and the Minnesota Agricultural Associate uh, Society. So yeah, this is uh, first fair Fort Snelling. Then um, the fair moved around quite a bit. Uh, never had a real permanent home through the 1860s and 1870s. And it became really clear that the fair needed a permanent home if it was to, to be all that it could be. This is a shot of, uh, from 1878 of uh, Ramsey County. And you can see over here on the, on the lower right corner for the map of St. Paul uh, for how the city streets laid out. That was a separate map. But what we see here, this, this, uh, this pink area here, I hope you can read it. If you can't, it says State Fairgrounds in Driving Park. It wasn't really officially the State Fairgrounds, but there was a horse driving park there. And this is along, you see Melrose Avenue that later became University. And you can see here, I hope you can see the arrow as well. You see what's called University uh, connected Hamlin uh, with the University of Minnesota, but later university following this line uh, at that angle, it stayed at that angle and it takes a bend right around Fairview now. Uh, Snelling Avenue uh, was actually called Snelling at that time. And right here, this green space says Alms House, that was Ramsey County Poor Farm. And the Poor Farm was the absolute worst fate you could have many people honestly would would have done anything uh than wind up at a poor farm but that's basically when when you had nothing left at all you went to the poor farm to grow your own food and that's where you lived and uh in the uh, right around 1880 there were talks about establishing a permanent fairgrounds in the twin cities and prior to that time it was in rochester Otana, uh, red wing there were uh, fairs here in saint paul and university there were also fairs in, uh, in Minneapolis, a guy named, uh, last name of King, he was doing competing fairs with the Ag Society, uh, but it, it became clear that it need, really needed a permanent home. And uh, there was commissions appointed from both St. Paul and Minneapolis. And uh, the term that we find in the old history books were the knives were out. So uh, the, the cities uh, didn't agree at all on much of anything back then and uh, they were unable to come up with, with a suitable location for the fairgrounds. It was agreeable. Uh, so the proposal wound up being uh, the St. Paul groups at somewhere in here, you know, right around what would have been Fairview 
uh, and university. And the Minneapolis group said, well, we're gonna have a state fair too, and we're gonna put ours at Minnehaha Park. And as long as the fairgrounds are moving, we might as well move the state capital over here as well. While all this was going on, uh, in very early 1885, Ramsey County said, we will uh, donate the 200 acre grounds of our poor farm to the state on the condition that the state agricultural society conduct an annual state fair. You know, they all understood the, the, the importance of a fair and bringing people together and, and, and improving knowledge and all, all the things fair does so. Uh, after, after a little persuading, the Minneapolis folks were reluctant at first. Uh, now this is not in, in uh, St. Paul at that particular time, the St. Paul city limits, you can see on the map here where they were. Um, but it, it, was, uh, it was pitched as being midway between Minneapolis and St. Paul. Truth is it's not, it, it is closer to St. Paul and eventually became surrounded by St. Paul. Um, but uh, the Ramsey County Board in a secret meeting, there is no such thing now, but this is before open meeting laws, uh, Ramsey County Board uh, donated this property and it became the home of the State Fair. Uh, two buildings were built initially that first year. This was called Old Main. It was the main building. It was the largest wooden dome structure in the world. You can get a, a, a idea of the size of it by looking at the, in the foreground, you can see some, some horses and some wagons and they're quite a bit out front of it. And it's located exactly, it was located exactly where today's agriculture horticulture building is. That was the first structure built in 1885 and the other, was the first grandstand double-decker wood affair and uh, parking you can see was a problem uh, then as well uh, even if uh, you could use uh, the infield and every other space imaginable uh, but this this was again the first of three grandstands so the the original the wood structure that in the main building were the only permanent structures on the new fairgrounds in 1885. Uh, other structures that come along uh, and, uh, and now go on. This is from 1903. This, is, this was called a horticulture building and it's sitting exactly where today's dairy building is. Uh, this building was built in 1903. It came down in the very early 50s and was replaced, not replaced, another, it took another 20 years, 25 years before the dairy building was built. And, uh, and it's, it just, it, it, it kills me now. Uh, there was a, a a uh, number of buildings all built about the same time. It's the dairy building, creative activities building, education building, uh, modern living building, uh, and all of them done with just this, this basic cinder block. And it, it couldn't have thought of putting in a window, you know, God forbid it, they're just these really basically ugly block buildings and we do the best we can with them. But when you look at, at what was there first in this stunning architecture, these beautiful buildings, it's just a shame they're they're not here anymore. Um, again, this 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 building was second generation, and now the it, it current building is is third generation. But there was a lot of influence from a fair in 1893, and we'll get to that. Uh, a World's Fair in 1893. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, here's another one. You can see up in the top. Uh, I love this. The woman singular woman's building state fairgrounds. This is a postcard. Uh, this building was built uh, in also 1903. And, and the ornate architecture is just stunning. And it was initially called a manufacturer's building. And I, if you can see my arrow moving around, up on the peak, there were four peaks and each peak had these, these huge cast, very light metal, uh, whatever they are, you can actually pick them up, but they're huge. And uh, there's, my, there's my arrow, sorry. Uh, that's all that's left of the buildings now. And it was called the manufacturer's buildings behind these heads in there. And we do have one of them and it's on the porch of the JV Bailey house uh, by the state fair greenhouses. Uh, behind the head is, uh, is like a, a, a wheel or a big gear shift uh, and uh, which goes back to its original intent as a manufacturer's building. And this, uh, the state fair had, well, our state had presence at world's fairs in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And this particular one was uh, from the, uh, there was a world's fair in St. Louis in 1904. 
And this got moved, it was the Minnesota building, it got moved to the state fairgrounds and it sat, here it is in uh, one of its later incarnations, the KSTP building. Uh, they actually moved into it uh, before they built their own. And this building was located exactly where the haunted house is uh, today. This, the original Hippodrome built in 1906, it, the footprint is actually larger than today's uh, Coliseum, which sits on the same site. But this building was, uh, was a huge deal at the time. And it also uh, housed an ice rink. During the winter, there was no coolant in the floor. There was nothing. They just opened the doors and let and let weather take over. And uh, there were a couple guys, uh, the Ship's Dad brothers and uh, Johnson, who entertained between hockey games here. And they wound up founding right here, Ship's Dad and Johnson's Ice Follies. And you can see down in the bottom, it says largest in the world, 270 by 119 feet. The building was uh, was huge, and you can see all the structure inside. How how nice that was, but that uh, that met a, a fate during World War, as a result of World War II. And I've got some photos of that coming up. And uh, here's a, a poster from 1910, and you can see down in the lower right corner is an illustration of the Hippodrome. And uh, it was uh, quite a point of pride with people back then that the fair says more grounds, more buildings, more people than any other fair. Uh, and and uh, what's also really cool, I think, Hamlin, Minnesota, midway between Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, it was not uh, anywhere near St. Paul city limits at that time. And it was identified as Hamlin because there was a post office at, at uh, Hamlin University. So the fairgrounds was also identified as the nearest post office. Uh, right now, the only buildings uh, that remain, and this was taken, uh, this map is from 1913, the only buildings that remain are the four that are highlighted in color. The first is uh, the grandstand, which was built, this is the third grandstand at the fairgrounds, and it was built in 1909. Uh, the J.B. Bailey House, which uh, was moved here, it actually started its life over here as uh, like a first aid uh, hospital slash infirmary. Uh, it was moved here in 1911 when the State Fair greenhouses were built and uh, was the residence for the, the family, uh, for the, the guy who ran the greenhouse in those days. And these two buildings here from 1907, the lower of the two is the Fine Arts Center, uh, the upper is the Progress Center. Uh, they were built uh, exclusively initially for ag, but then served a lot of different functions in the meantime. And when, when, uh, whenever I see photos of uh, illustrations of like the, the old uh, Creative Activities building and what's there now, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that we have at least some of these old buildings uh, that remain. And uh, we're very determined to keep everything that that we can they, they've all taken on historical significance and you think of things like like uh, uh, stadiums for instance and the short shelf lives they have uh, I, I used to videotape the twins when I was in college and they were at old Met Stadium you know they're on they're on their third their third stadium since then which is in the third one's 10 years old or more um, meanwhile, we have a grandstand from 1909 that's like our cathedral that's still there, plus two exhibit buildings from 1907, but that, that's really what makes the fairgrounds, part of what makes the fairgrounds so special is we have all this history right here. And if you look at the, at the center, the lower center, the streetcar loop, there were streetcars from Minneapolis that came uh, from the west and uh, that came from the east. You can see down there, it says Como Harriet car line, Randolph Hope car line. That was a, the means of transportation in the Twin Cities back then. And again, this is from 1913. You can see how far in those tracks went because that's where everybody went. And very interestingly, Langford Avenue uh, became Como Avenue at, at one point. Uh, but it, it, the the primary means of getting to the fair was streetcars, and in a lot of ways we've come full circle because right now half of the people attend the, that attend the fair uh, come by transit of some sort. And with our transit hub that we built in 2014, 
uh, and uh, also with uh, uh, bus service. And now there's more and more young people, especially, uh, that are uh, doing rideshare and uh, using that those means uh, to get to the state fair. But it's it this has always uh, it's always struck me the older I get the, the more it does that, that how in in many ways we we're, we're closing that circle uh, by going back to transit and it's a great thing. Uh, in 1913, a guy named Austin McFadden, he ran, uh, he had amusement parks uh, on piers, built on piers, that's what you did, in California. And he pitched the fair on building a roller coaster, the Cannonball. And the uh, fair said no at that time, yeah, I weren't too sure about it, we didn't know how it would go over. And uh, he came back a year later and he said, listen, let me build a roller coaster and I'll throw in a merry-go-round. So the, the fair at that time, this, the management state fair board said, ah, okay, you know, kind of reluctantly. So he got his roller coaster. This picture was taken uh, in the very early 20s, uh, made of wood. The roller coaster uh, didn't last for even 20 years. And, and it was located right where uh, the old Penny Arcade and the Butterfly House is today. So just east of uh, the grandstand and the old grandstand bleachers, this is where the cannonball coaster was. Uh, and in what turns out to be just a beautiful case of, of, of uh, irony isn't the right word, but the, the roller coaster is long gone, but the throw in merry-go-round is still with us. And you can ride it at at Como Park, and if it can't be at the fair, then it's uh, it's got a great home where it is. I would love to see it at the fair. Jerry Kafeschen, uh, who was a donor that stepped up, and uh, just very quickly, the merry-go-round, the carousel was at the fair, uh, starting in 1914. It, it it moved once on the fairgrounds, and it was located right where its last home was, right where the the visitor's plaza is now, which is just up the street from the grandstand and it would have been right across the street from that original roller coaster. Uh, the owners uh, in the early 1980s, these old carousels, and this one is uh, made by the Philadelphia Toboggan Company, it's PT-66. Uh, artisans, most of them were from Germany. They carved all these horses. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, any remaining uh, carousel uh, merry-go-round from back in those days was far more valuable uh, as uh, uh, individual artworks. When you look at the horses, uh, they were it, it worth it. Would, and at that time, if would if it would have had it gone to auction, it would have been you know the, the worth over. They would have got way more than way over a million bucks for those horses. And uh, so the family that owned it, you know, it really wasn't making much as a ride. And when you're sitting on something that's that that's that valuable, uh, nobody could blame them. So they did put it up for auction, but uh, Peter Bame from, from St. Paul uh, had a, has a real, a real understanding, a great appreciation of history. And he organized a group because the fair was in no position to buy it. Uh, it. We would have been buying all these artworks basically. And, and in those days, back in the early eighties uh, at over a million dollars, it just, it just couldn't have happened. It just wouldn't have happened. Uh, so Peter organized a group. They got together with fundraising, and then Jerry Kafeschen, who's uh, uh, one of the uh, West Publishing executives, uh, he also had a had a great appreciation for for carousels and for art, and he stepped up and and he contributed uh, a significant amount. I don't know exactly how much, so I, I hate to guess at it, but it was it, it, it was it was huge and. Uh, when he stepped up to save the carousel, uh, put his name on it, and it has a wonderful home right now in Como Park. And you look at the, the horses, they're all restored. And when it was at the fair, uh, it didn't look like this at all. What had happened over the years was because it was just seen as a ride and it was, you know, just basically sitting there for all but a couple weeks of the year. They'd done things over the years, like like uh, putting varnish on them. And uh, you know, they thought they were doing the right thing, but, but basically uh, it didn't. And uh, thankfully it didn't create any permanent damage. But once these horses were restored by all the volunteers with uh, our fair carousel, it's just a beautiful, beautiful uh, ride. It's part of our living history. And if you look at the, look at the horses, those on the outside rows, 
Now they did this in a hurry. The artists did this in a hurry. Those on the outside row are more intricate and larger than those on the inside rows. And that's not always the case. When they have plenty of time uh, to produce something, uh, the inside horses were really, really ornate as well. Now they're all beautiful, they're all gorgeous, but uh, uh, next time you're there, yeah, take a look. You'll see the outside horses look just a little bit better. And we're so glad, and I am, you know, being a neighborhood guy, uh, that that it found it found a home very close to its original place and and actually people enjoy it uh, all all spring summer and fall now and that wouldn't have happened had it stayed at the fair so you know all in all it's in it's in a great spot there is one old ride still operating at the fair though and that's the old mill it was built in 1915 uh, and the same family owned and operated it for four generations. Uh, and we, we hear from folks all the time. They say more memories were made here than anywhere else. And uh, the family, it was just a few years ago, uh, it was in the mid-teens, uh, right when it was uh, celebrating its 100th anniversary, uh, decided that they could no longer operate it. Uh, it it it's, there's a lot of work and it needs all kinds of maintenance. So the state fair, because it is part of our history, uh, we bought the old mill from the family and have done a lot of work on it in the meantime, you know, replacing boats and uh, installing a lot of safety features. What, what, uh, whatever would have been considered uh, good and, uh, and, and safe in 1915, it doesn't really work anymore. So there's a lot of life safety features and a lot of maintenance and just other sorts of work. New pump, it, it had actually the, the, the original electric motor that drives the pump was still in use over a hundred years later. And while that's uh, an engineering marvel uh, and a testament to how well things were built back then, it's really not all that efficient. So uh, it, not practical to continue using that. So uh, so a lot of that was replaced along with the fair ownership of it. Uh, these photos, I love these photos. This was taken from uh, the, the top corner of the brand new grandstand in 1909. And you can see here, hope you can see my arrow. That's the Creative Activities Building. This is Dan Patch Avenue. So it's looking out onto Midway what became known as Midway Parkway. But you can see all this space here. That tree line in the back is Como Park. And the neighbor, well, there is no neighborhood. It's just, it's just wide open. It was all plotted, but none of it was developed yet. So at this point, the fair was already on its third grandstand. Uh, and in a lot of cases, second generation buildings, there was still no neighborhood there. You know, I'll zoom in just a little bit. You can get a little better look. Again, this is the Creative Activities Building. You can see a little better here, the trees connecting Como Park with the fair. And uh, the idea, you know how Como runs at a slant from the park down to the Capitol? The whole idea of that was to connect, uh, number one, connect uh, downtown and the Capitol with, the, with Como Park. And then also uh, the, the finishing piece, then to connect the park with the fairgrounds was right here. It became uh, known uh, later as Midway Parkway. Uh, another aerial shot, we're jumping ahead here to the mid thirties. You can see this was all that empty space. Now it's all full of houses. And if you walk through the neighborhood, uh, it's, it's real clear when things were built. My house uh, where I grew up on Brita was uh, built in the eight, very late 1800s. There were like three houses uh, north of the, all the railroad tracks and, and the house I grew up in was one of them. Most of those houses didn't come along until the teens. And if you walk somewhere like, uh, oh, here's uh, this, well, I'll zoom in in a minute and, and, uh, and show you that one in particular, but yeah, this is all fairgrounds and you can see along here. Again, I hope you can see the arrow, that's Snelling. This is what was Bethel College and a big block, wide open. Uh, this is now the Job Corps. And of course, all this space is filled up uh, with, uh, with, with dorms and other classrooms and other facilities. But this is Arlington right here, uh, running uh, all the way to the park. Snelling, Arlington, uh, uh, Asbury, Arona, and here, let's zoom in a little bit. Here's Bethel down in the lower left corner. 
And we can see Pascal here. See this white building? This is on the east side of Pascal. This is where Holy Childhood is today. Uh, this building here, this is the original Lingblomston up on a hill. My wife grew up right there, just barely off the screen. But that's the original Lingblomston. Uh, they had a big wide porch uh, facing the west. And all of this space, of course, became part of their campus. Here's an area that when we were kids, we called it the cow pasture. Um, we're trusting, uh, our, we were trusting our elders that in fact, there were cows there. Uh, uh, hence the name. But uh, here's a stretch of Midway Parkway. And then when we go up in the upper right corner, this tall building, it's between Almond and Albany. And this was an orphanage. And, and I remember it very well. Uh, my wife, who grew up just a couple blocks away, uh, has no recollection. It, was, uh, it would have been torn down when we were seven or eight years old. Uh, but it, if you go down, uh, take a walk down Albany, between Albany and Almond and going down either street, you can see all the houses on the, like on the south side of Albany, they're, they're all from the very early 1900s. On the north side of Albany, they're from the 20s and some from the 30s. But then when you get to the end of that block, all the houses are from the 1960s. So you really get a good look at how things evolved uh, in the neighborhood. And, and there it's, it's right in front of you, you know, if you, if you take a look at it. But yeah, there's the orphanage again, Holy Childhood wound up in here. A lot of these houses uh, are still very uh, familiar to us all today because they're, they're still all there. Uh, this is a shop, same time, mid thirties. And the grandstand at that point had two racetracks. One was a half mile, that's on the inside. And then the other uh, full mile on, uh, on the outside uh, and folks all over the place. Most of these buildings that, that you can see from the 30s, other than the grandstand itself, are long gone. Uh, and you see these bleachers on either side of the grandstand, they would have been brand new then. There was a lot of the fairgrounds that was built, built up during WPA days. And that was typical of fairgrounds basically all over the country. They were just very big. Uh, they were very, very big for uh, utilizing uh, WPA and uh, and states everywhere were uh, were jumping on board with that. Here we talked about the merry-go-round. You can see the roller coaster would have been here, and that's long gone. But this is the building that housed the merry-go-round. So here's the same photo zoomed in. It's a little blurry. I apologize, but uh, it, it's a really good look and again how the neighborhood evolved and how it grew up around the fair this is snelling uh, again bethel just from a, a little different angle uh, today's job core and all of their space but look at these houses they're all they're all white they all look pretty much the same and this is that stretch uh between arlington and this is hoyt up here and look north of hoyt it's absolutely nothing it was still all farm fields uh, in the 30s. And again, if you just look at the houses, you can see uh, by their architecture when they were built. And uh, most of the houses in Falcon Heights, they're 50s and 60s. And that hadn't happened yet. This is, uh, and this is the stretch along, uh, along Hoyt running up to, uh, up to Snelling. Oh, so now we'll review a little bit of history. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, uh, the, the presenter view you get where you know what's coming next. I don't, I'm seeing it along with you. So, uh, so we're, we're seeing all of these together first time. Uh, 1901, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was at the fair. He was vice president and he gave a speech that was known as initially the Minnesota speech, but it was uh, the walk softly or talk softly. I'm sorry, talk softly, carry a big stick. It's an old West African proverb, and uh, he first brought that up at the fair. Five days after his appearance at the state fair, uh, President McKinley was shot uh, at, uh, in Buffalo, New York. President he died eight days later, and, uh, and TR became president, and he was defined by what was first known as the Minnesota speech because he gave it here but then later became the big stick speech. And this is an old Thomas Nast cartoon, a uh, very famous political cartoonist from way back. And uh, 
any anything you see with with Teddy Roosevelt, any kind of caricature or anything, any type of these cartoons, all all showed the big stick. And again, that was that speech was given here. Uh, Dan Patch was a pacer horse, not not a trotter, but pacer horse races with the sulky behind were were a huge draw in the very early 1900s. And Dan Patch was much bigger than most pacer horses, and he was incredibly fast. He uh, he set a world record here at the Minnesota State Fair on that mile track of one minute and 55 seconds. And at that time, uh, it was difficult for the horse's owners, for uh, uh, William, for uh, Savage, uh, Savage Minnesota, named after him, uh, to find horses to race them. Dan Patch was just too fast, so he would he would run against the clock and uh, he set the that record here, that world record here. Uh, in 1906, and the popularity of, of Dan Patch in particular is what led to the construction of the new grandstand. So it truly is the house that Dan Patch built. And back in the 90s, we uh, uh, renamed the street uh, Midway Parkway. When it hit the fairgrounds, it became Commonwealth and stayed Commonwealth through St. Anthony Park. It's all the same street. We renamed it Dan Patch in honor of uh, this amazing and he was really, truly a sports star and, and like the first one with all sorts of uh, endorsements. His picture was all over everything. You know, you could buy tins and food and toys and all the rest with Dan Patch. So he was, he was uh, really a thing, really quite the deal. The first airplane flight in Minnesota uh, heavier than air flight uh, was also at the at the fairgrounds not during the fair but in june there was an air show 1910 and uh, this right by plane was the first heavier than air flight so both uh, the first lighter than air and heavier than air flights took place one during a territorial fair and the other right here at the state fairgrounds and i think back to the the photography equipment available then and those old photos, you look at those old black and white photos, the detail is incredible. You can zoom in super tight and it just doesn't lose anything. They're, they're amazing. Uh, not so much when you're trying to capture something in motion. So uh, even though these planes in those days didn't fly very fast at all, it's still a wonder that with the uh, photo equipment of the day that they were able to get anything at all. Uh, 1927, uh, if there ever was a rock star, was John Philip Sousa, and he played at the fair and uh, performed the Minnesota March, which is the official song at the University of Minnesota. This is in the park outside the grandstand. It's uh, near where like the WCCO TV building is now, just east of the grandstand ramp. If you look behind the bandstand here, you can see at that time, it was a wooden ramp over the that ran over the the street, and then when you got to uh, you got a little further south, it was uh, made of of uh, earth. It was just basically an earth embankment. The new uh, grandstand ramp, the new one, is from 1937. That was built as a WPA project, but in 1927, it was still it was still a combination of wood and earth. Uh, the idea that John Philip Sousa had was he was going to present the the march the original manuscript to the University of Minnesota but the the officials at the U uh, wouldn't go to meet Sousa they they said well he, he can come and see us if he wishes so uh, he was a very good natured guy and an awful lot of fun he said well if if uh if, if the you won't come here, I'll just give it to the state. So they arranged a ceremony last minute. He presented it to the uh, president of the fair at the time. William Sanger was his name from Southern Minnesota. And today that original manuscript resides with the State Historical Society. Been presidents, vice presidents at the fair. Here's, here's Ike, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, he said, in all sincerity said, I've never been uh, to anything like this. This is the best state fair I've ever, I've ever seen. It's also the only state fair I've ever seen. Uh, this was in 1947, but other, other presidents or vice presidents who became president who visited the fair. We talked about TR already, but William Howard Taft was here. Uh, Calvin Coolidge was here. 
And, uh, and Coolidge had uh, about a 90 minute presentation. And, and back then you look at photos of people at the fair and they're dressed up. They, all the men are in coats and, and hats and all the women are in long dresses. And that time of year, uh, it's pretty, it, it can get pretty warm. We all, we all know. So it was one of those 90 degree days and, uh, and uh, Calvin Coolidge, he was actually the warm up for the auto races. About 50 minutes into his speech, uh, the crowd started, uh, started chanting for the auto races to begin. And uh, he was a very good natured guy as well. And he basically skipped over the last half hour of his speech to let the races start. Uh, and he got huge applause for that. Uh, there have been, uh, I almost said five fairs canceled, uh, and that's out of habit. Uh, there are six fairs that have been canceled. Uh, the first was in 1861, and remember back in those days, they basically threw them together in, in a few weeks. There just there wasn't a lot of population uh, yet at Minnesota, and that was really one of the purposes of those early agricultural fairs. It was to, to show off the agricultural potential here and to attract more people to move to the state. But uh, in 1861, uh, Fort Snelling was, uh, that photo I showed you was from 1860 from the, um, uh, that, the first state fair there. Uh, Fort Snelling was going to be the site again, but the Civil War uh, began on April 12th and the fort was being used uh, by the US Army for training and, uh, and for uh, recruiting and for uh, uh, camping and barracks and everything else. Uh, crops were poor that year, uh, times were generally rough, and another location wasn't sought because uh, it, just, it just wasn't the time with the Civil War. And then, and then a year later, 1862, the Civil War continued, but also the, uh, one of the most tragic episodes in Minnesota's history, the Dakota conflict, uh, the Native Americans that, that were living in southern Minnesota were were getting moved to reservations. There was no, there wasn't nearly enough, enough food or really anything for them, and uh, and uh, it turned into a it turned into a conflict uh, that along with uh, with the Civil War and and just a lot of uncertainty about the times led to uh, the second cancellation. The next cancellation, 1893, I mentioned earlier, there was a great world's fair. This was called the World's Columbian Exposition. It was called Columbian because it was to celebrate uh, the uh, 400th anniversary, anniversary of uh, Christopher Columbus at the fair of uh, 1892. Uh, they didn't have things ready, so they bumped it back a year to 1893, but the, the architecture here was extraordinary. This fair, uh, and Chicago on, on the lakefront, uh, the fairgrounds were uh, 522 acres. You think our fairgrounds are big, ours are 322. So it was, it was nearly twice the size. And you look at this, this stunning architecture, these beautiful buildings, they were all temporary. The fair ran from May 1st through uh, the end of October and the equivalent of, uh, equivalents of 20% of the, of the US population attended, but these buildings were temporary. It just, it's, it's, it just, it, it, it's incredible to, to, to think of that. Uh, they were made of, of plywood with, uh, with plaster coating and, and everything came out white. There was some debate about what color to paint the buildings and uh, Daniel Burnham, he also had a role here in, in, uh, in architecture, especially when we get to some parts of Como Park. Uh, he, he said, let's leave them white became known as the White City. And uh, there's a great book out called The Devil in the White City. And it's alternating chapters, uh, historical. Uh, it's all, it's uh, no fiction in it. It's, uh, it. it's all the history of the, of the World's Fair and how it got done and how it got built. But then also with a, a serial, there's also, uh, you know, um, uh, suspense, I guess you'd call it, or a, a crime novel, because there was also a serial killer that lived in Chicago near the fair, and it kind of weaves the two together. But again, these buildings were just amazing, and they had a lot of influence. And, and if you remember the photos of uh, of the at least some of the buildings here, the uh, old horticulture building, 
and the Creative Activities Building had uh, very much the same kind of architecture. There is one building remaining in Chicago, and it's it's a, a museum of like engineering and manufacturing. That was the only building that was built to last, and it's still there on the lakefront. Uh, also at the at the Chicago World's Fair, the very first Ferris wheel uh, in uh, 1889. There was a World's Fair in Paris, and uh, the Eiffel Tower was built to commemorate that. And initially. The residents of Paris couldn't stand it. It was an eyesore. It's nearly a thousand feet high. And now, of course, it symbolizes not only Paris, but France. They, they grew to like it, and, uh, but it took them a while. So with, with Eiffel Tower being this iconic attraction with the, with the uh, uh, Paris World's Fair, the idea for the Chicago World's Fair was what are we going to come up with and basically all they came up with were different versions of uh, the tower uh, until finally a very young guy George Ferris he was a uh, uh, he was a, a, a metals guy and a metals engineer from Pittsburgh he he proposed this wheel now each of these cars could carry up to 60 people this was uh, almost 300 feet tall which means that it's almost as high it was almost as high as the space tower here at our fair. Uh, by comparison, the the big giant wheel that, that is now uh, part of the uh, portable, uh, but uh, part of our, our fairscape during the fair is uh, 152 feet high. It has a capacity of about uh, 210 people total. That original, and we'll go back to it, the, the very first Ferris wheel had a capacity of nearly 2,000 people. So uh, as big as this wheel is, imagine, imagine one a, a even larger. So the Chicago World's Fair was a, was a huge deal. Uh, and fairs all over, uh, all over the Northwestern part of the state, uh, U.S. And we were, uh, us in the Dakotas, we were uh, getting to be well, I don't know if the quotas were even states yet, but they all decided not to hold fairs, uh, not to conflict with it. So uh, those that did go on uh, uh, got clobbered. And it, it, it was presumed because of the Minnesota State Fair's reputation and, uh, and just its, its reach that some of the exhibits uh, wouldn't have gone to the World's Fair, thereby uh, decreasing Minnesota's uh, representation there and nobody wanted that either so uh, a, a number of Minnesota exhibits including this guy H.F. Uh, Brown he actually won a, uh, a ribbon for uh, best herd of shorthorn cattle and that, that fair that, that world's fair was influential in so many ways uh, that's where uh, Pabst Pabst beer was introduced. You know, we call it Pabst Blue Ribbon. It won its Blue Ribbon at that World's Fair. Uh, Cracker Jacks, hot dogs, hamburgers, uh, the Zipper, all made their debut at that at that World's Fair. And this is Minnesota's building uh, at the World's Fair. Again, like all the rest, it was uh, built as temporary structures. And you know, we, we think we can do some amazing things today. You think back then. This is 1893, and they built these beautiful buildings with with. Uh, no intention of hanging on to them. They were all designed to come down. Other cancellations, World War II and the State Fair. Uh, the World War started September 1st when Hitler invaded Poland. The U.S. Uh, was uh, uh, officially entered the war December 11th after uh, the December 7th attack on Pearl Harbor. And uh, in June of 1942, so the U.S. was just getting into the war, the federal government was all over every fair everywhere to voluntarily cancel. Uh, the Minnesota State Fair, uh, the uh, Eastern States Exposition in, in Massachusetts, Springfield, Massachusetts, and some other large fairs all said, no, we need to, we need to go on, we should go on. Uh, World War I, the fair went on uh, as an educational presentation just to show how essential it is that that uh, that agriculture continue to be uh, uh, brought forward to people that education goes on and that and and that this is a really important part of the war effort so they took the same the same uh, approach in world war ii and it was uh, the themes were food 
uh, for victory. So 42, 43, and 44, the fair went ahead despite, and other fairs went ahead despite uh, the federal government going, you know, we, we really don't want you to do this. Uh, well, during the fair, and there were many fairs around the country, uh, Texas State Fair in Dallas, Oklahoma State Fair in Oklahoma City, uh, Louisiana State Fair in Shreveport, uh, many fairgrounds all over the country. The, the government basically took them over. And in some cases they were POW camps, in other, pla in other places they were, they were uh, basic training facilities and barracks. And here uh, the feds took over the entire livestock complex. So now we're talking about uh, the, the old, you can see the old hippodrome in the back, the uh, sheep and poultry barn, the horse barn, the, the cattle barn, swine barn and leased they rented it from the fair and then they leased it in turn to the A.O. Smith Manufacturing Company from Milwaukee and they built military aircraft propellers here. And you can see restricted, no liquor, no cameras, no firearms by order of the War Department. And this was on Como Avenue. This was one checkpoint. Uh, there was double fencing. You can see if you look through the fence, you can see additional fencing on the other side. Uh, so you entered here, then you went all the way around to the north side where there was a second checkpoint before you could get in. It was a military installation. So this is the cattle barn uh, under normal circumstances, a huge building. And you, you kind of get a sense here, but, but it's one of those things where you kind of really got to be there. Well, that, this is what it looks like, what it looked like nor, normally during, during the fair. This is what it looked like during World War II with all the machinery, a lot of the heavy machinery. And actually we had uh, just a few years back, there was some big snow load. It caved in a portion of the roof. And uh, as part of the repair, we replaced all of the electric. The electric system in there was left over from uh, uh, the mid '40s when this building, when the cattle barn and all the rest were all part of that uh, part of that propeller plant. Uh, I got a call from a lady, so nice. She said she, when she was a kid, she's right out of high school. She said she worked at the propeller plant on the fairgrounds, and and it was just it was amazing talking to her. I had, I had a, just a ton of questions. I said, you were, you were in the poultry barn? She said, yes. I said, you were in a barn. What was that like? She said, oh, it was great. It was wonderful. Uh, and I got to thinking about it a little bit. At that point, the building was only a few years old. And with these photos, you know, for all I know, that's her down. In, uh, she's, she's one of the, one of the ladies down in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, but yeah, it would have been a new building. She said it was great, plenty of space. And, uh, and that's a building where they managed all of the uh, administration and all of the, all of the office type work that went along with the, the uh, propeller plant. Now this is inside uh, the old Hippodrome. Remember, uh, we're ice rink only. This is clearly not winter. This is during a fair, during a horse show. This is what it looked like during World War II. And what happened was because of all of this equipment uh, and the changes they needed to make to the building, uh, when they moved out at the conclusion of the war, uh, it was, it was uh, destroyed beyond any sort of use at all. So that building was raised a couple of years later and then replaced with this. And this is our current uh, Warner Coliseum. You can see it's all uh, all poured concrete structure. I've seen one other building that looks like this, and that's at the uh, Western Livestock Showgrounds in Denver. And the reason they don't build these barrel-shaped roofs anymore is because they don't really work. They leak, and that's it's been a problem. It was a problem for for the fair here way before uh, my time, and it, it remains a, a challenge today. But uh, that's the last time the fair received any kind of public funding at all. It was uh, it was in a repayment for the fair's loss of the old hippodrome and um, uh, replacement with the new Coliseum, which opened up in the very early 50s. So this is the old main, remember the original building, uh, old main, and, and just beyond that, look to the, look at the dome and just to the left of the dome, that's the horticulture building that sits where the uh, dairy building uh, is today. But if you look down on the, on the lower left side, you see that highlighted area, that uh, pink area there? 
That's all that was left of the building after a fire, November of uh, 1944. Uh, the greenhouse residence is right across the street. Remember, that's one of the structures, one of the uh, only structures that were here in the early 1900s. And I, and I had the privilege of talking with Ralph Zimmerman. He was the head of the greenhouse in uh, the, the 40s and 50s. And uh, he was, at that point, he was well into his 80s. But he said, while that fire was going on, he said, you could see, if you couldn't actually see the flames throughout the rest of the cities, you could see a glow uh, on, the, you know, on, on the horizon. It, it was in, in the heat from that, uh, you know, I'll go back one, the, the heat from all, it was all wood, the heat from that. He said he was uh, in the house, they were, they were uh, throwing water on the curtains so they wouldn't catch fire from, uh, from this structure going down. And uh, it sits right on the location of today's agriculture, horticulture building. And this building is just a beauty. The, the, uh, the architecture, the design, and, and what we've done recently, if you look on either side where it says horticulture, there's all this beautiful bas relief sculpture in here. And uh, they never got past painting it white. And, and, and I wanted to be really careful when we did this, but we worked with, with a, a, just a, a great design firm uh, and uh, coming up with, a, with some color scheme that, that, that would really bring this relief out without compromising the building. And it just, it looks so much better today. But again, this, this kind of architecture, you just, you just don't see. And that's why we put such a priority on retaining uh, these old structures and, and you know, really keeping the, 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 the heart of the fair alive. So after 1945, uh, the fair, uh, the, the Fed said, never mind, we're not going to leave it up to you anymore. We're going to cancel you. And they did. Uh, ironically, the, the war, World War II was over before the fair would have been held. But, but, uh, but they, they said back then that, uh, nope, they want all, all of our efforts and all of our energies focused on, on ending the war. So there was a great fair Victory Fair plan for 1946, uh, and a polio epidemic came along, and we can see here August 12th, the U of M Ag Extension Division said all 4-H club activities are going to be canceled, and fair officials met with uh, health officials and others, and all agreed uh, by in late August that the, the there could be no fair, and that was just uh, uh, 10 days before it was to start. Uh, there have been other cancellations along the way, not of the whole fair, but in uh, 46, uh, there was a, a disease specifically in chickens that led to the cancellation of the poultry show. Uh, and there's uh, more often, I guess, than, than, than we wish, there, there are different diseases with, uh, with swine. They're, genetically, they're, they're just something about them where it's easy for viruses to jump. So, uh, so issues do come up uh, with swine and, and, uh, and uh, pork production. That's just kind of part of the deal. In 2015, I remember this very well, the avian flu at that time uh, led to cancellation of, of anything having to do with birds, really. Um, but uh, we had, instead, we had educational exhibits on poultry, and uh, some of the kids uh, doing the exhibits, 4-H and FFA kids, they said, actually, they learned way more doing that type of exhibit than, uh, than bringing birds in to be judged. So I, I still slip up and say five cancellations. Well, now we have one of our very own. Uh, I use it. Uh, uh, an attendance chart just to show how the fair has just grown steadily over the decades that goes back to 1900 and there's a gap of course from 1945 and 46 and one of our fine young staffers says it's really a shame that uh, that we see those gaps in there as so, well now we have one of our very own uh, and uh, uh, 2020 we've all lived COVID, we know what the deal is when you're in the when you're in the, the the business of bringing people together, and there's a virus. There's just no way that can happen, and 
uh, and we know how this has affected all of our lives in such dramatic ways. But uh, I, I took this photo on what would have been a fair day, and here when there's no fair. So uh, what do people ask? You know, we, we talk about the educational opportunities uh, that the fair offers, that uh, all, all, that we, uh, all that we can do. And when you do these, I don't know what, the, what the, the type of chart is. I know there's a name for it. But, but you, you take the frequency with which things come up. And these are the questions that specifically people ask us and that we work really hard to get answered. There's some amazing people that staff our fair exhibits. You go in the ag, uh, agriculture, horticulture building, for instance, and, and you will get rock stars in the field of, of, of agronomy, ag, horticulture, all of these things. Many of these questions get answered right there and not from a program, but you can literally have one-on-ones with experts in all of these. Uh, the food, we mentioned that earlier, you know, what, what folks, uh, a lot of them think, you know, that there's everything's fried, everything's on a stick. Uh, no, it's not. We had 47 new foods last year. Two were deep fried and two others uh, were on a stick. So uh, reality clashes with, uh, with the image that we have, but what you get at the fair, in many cases, you take a look at this. If you were in a restaurant, uh, at a place with table linen service, that, that's the kind of dish this is, except at the fair, you get it in a paper boat with a napkin. Uh, as, as we look ahead, uh, transit I mentioned is, is, has become uh, the dominant way of getting to the fair. And in 2014, uh, we built a new transit hub along with a West End uh, market, which takes a whole new approach to, to exhibits and a different kind of uh, just uh, commercial exhibits and entertainment and, and all the rest. But folks are coming now uh, principally by transit and, and this, is, this is the principal gate coming in. Well, you know, really the, the fair has, and it, it always has been, you know, as human beings, we have a, have a need to get together. We have a need to share positive experiences and explore all the senses. And uh, we do so through many ways, including uh, in our art show. This is the largest juried art show, uh, one of the largest in the nation actually, and it's right here at our state fair. And, you know, we talk about senses. Uh, I love the Egg Hort building. As soon as you step in, you get a little whiff of Christmas trees and our Christmas tree exhibit is, uh, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a very nice respite, but it's also like a real deal. And it helps, it helps tell the story of how important Christmas trees are as a crop to Minnesota's agriculture and horticulture community. And full disclosure, that's my granddaughter, Claire. This picture is from a few years ago. She's a little taller these days, but uh, not surprisingly, she uh, and my other four grandkids are all huge fair fans. But again, we're about bringing people together and, and sharing in experiences. And when you're at the fair, it, it, it really doesn't matter at all who you are, where you're from. It's just such a wonderful opportunity to, to, to see everybody, to explore new cultures, to get I, new, new ideas and a greater understanding of each other. And this is from uh, Among American Day. It's an outstanding event on a Labor Day. Uh, we've had it now. I've, if I say it seems like five or six years, it's probably 10 or 12, but it's one of the best days we have. And it's just so great to see uh, everybody, everybody embrace this, this type of activity at the fair. Again, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, it, whatever's going on in the world, it's all left outside. And the Lord knows we need places where we can get together and just celebrate who we are, celebrate our humanity. And I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll leave you with this. This is a great story. This is Larry Yazzie, Native Pride Dancers. My wife was a teacher's aide at Chelsea for 13 years. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 18 years, but she's, she's uh, been re uh, retired for a while now. But uh, Larry's son went to Chelsea, so she got familiar with, uh, with the Native Pride dancers then. And part of, part of Larry's presentation is they'll bring people from the crowd up on, uh, up on the stage to perform. This young man, Native American heritage, he'd never 
danced before. He'd never done any kind of, he hadn't been exposed to that part of Native American culture. And look at, look at his face. Now this is Larry in the background. You can see him looking on, looking on a young man here. I'll blow it up a little bit. It's fuzzy, I'm sorry, but doesn't he look like the proud papa right there? But then you, you, see, you see that young man and, and how, how happy he is and, and just the pure joy uh, as, as he's connecting and it's amazing. And that leads us to places like right here. Uh, I saw this guy, I went, oh my gosh. Uh, my son actually spotted him. He said, is that little kid dressed like Fair, Fairchild? Yes, yes. So uh, end of the day, it's been just a wonderful privilege to be associated with the State Fair. Uh, uh, starting there uh, literally as a kid, as a 15 year old, not really realizing how much the fair means to so many people, you know, how important it is to the community in many ways, uh, economically, certainly, you know, the, the fair has an economic impact in the Twin Cities of, of a Super Bowl every year, but we do it quietly. Uh, we don't, uh, you know, there's not news releases or anything on it, but more important socially, and that's what we need as human beings, especially now, especially now, to be brought together to celebrate who we are, to celebrate our humanity. And it's right here. It's a big part of our neighborhood. And uh, for me, I'm so fortunate, uh, so blessed, and I'm so grateful uh, to, to have been able to spend my life uh, bringing people together at, at an event as, as important as the State Fair. So uh, I think if I hit this button now, the slides will go away. And I'm not sure what I just did. You stopped sharing your screen and uh, now we're looking back at you. Okay. <laughs> You'd rather look at the screen, but uh, that's a whole lot of talking. And I and Zoom, Zoom is, is a wonderful substitute for nothing at all, but it's a poor substitute for the real thing. I look forward to getting together with everybody again real soon. I, and normally I entertain questions as we, and comments as we go along. Really hard to do with Zoom, uh, and I apologize for that, but I would sure be happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Yeah, if anybody has questions, just feel free to either unmute yourself and uh, share your thoughts, uh, or you can type it in the chat, that works as well. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Thanks so much for the wonderful presentation. It was great. Um, I actually just had a quick question. I heard you mention the greenhouses a few times. Yes. Um, and as a many year state fair goer, I'm not sure I've ever seen those and it sounded like they do still exist. So I was just wondering if, if that's correct, if they do still exist and kind of where they are and, and whether people can see them and what they're used for, et cetera, just if you're able to share a little bit more. And thanks again for the great presentation. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Amy. This is Amy. Yes. 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 Yeah, Amy. There, the greenhouses were established in 1911, and uh, you, you go back a ways. You know, you look at those old photos, those aerial photos. If you could see to the north a little further along uh, Larpenter Avenue, there were a lot of commercial greenhouses. Hermes Floral was there. Uh, there were, and I'm, I'm forgetting names, Labens, but there were half a dozen. And, and it, it made sense back then, what, as those commercial greenhouses were getting established, the fair said, you know what, we can use our own as well. And, and the, the horticulture, some of, the, some of what was done uh, 100 years ago was just amazing. And there's just a, a couple of relics remaining from those days. One is, that, is the Liberty Bell, the topiary, and then also the gates ajar. Uh, one is on the east side of the Egg Court building. The other is on the west side. Uh, but uh, we have old photos, black and white. I'd love to see them in color. It's just these amazing gardens, giant cannas all over the grounds. Some of that stuff remains, but it's evolved over time uh, where, where now it's in the more contemporary landscape design and that kind of thing. But the greenhouses, the, the fair raised its own, most of its own plants, but there's also a lot of trading going on with the, with the uh, commercial greenhouses. They're still there. 
You look at the Space Tower, immediately to the south, there's a big yellow house called the J.V. Bailey House. That's now the headquarters for the State Fair Foundation, which is a 501c3 funding raising arm of the fair. But attached to the house, there are two long permanent greenhouses. And when I was a kid, there were, were even more greenhouses, believe it or not, with uh, uh, temporary sheds and then hot boxes and all kinds of things. Uh, as the gardens have evolved over the years, the fair doesn't grow quite so many of its own. And instead, if you look at uh, uh, old Beaver Brothers Landscaping uh, and uh, Minnesota Water Garden Society and, and others are now maintaining, man maintaining these really beautiful green spaces and gardens. So, so we're not growing quite as many plants as we do, but it's still a big part of what we do. And uh, and you go to the fair, go to the fairgrounds, go for a ride this afternoon, you know, right across the street, just south All of this right. space tower, you'll see the greenhouses. Very cool. I had no idea. Thanks so much for that extra info. Appreciate it. And we have a question in the chat. This is from Ashley. How, uh, how long have you worked for the state fair and in what roles? And I'm wondering what, if any, big changes might be in store for the fair in the coming years. I, well, thanks for the question. I started again when I was 15. I'm 67 right now. Uh, and I did greenhouse all through uh, high school at Creighton College at St. Thomas. And uh, actually I wound up very briefly at a newspaper, Southern Minnesota. There's a picture uh, back in those days in the mid seventies, uh, there were St. Paul, the dispatch was the afternoon paper. The Pioneer Press was the morning paper and Minneapolis had the Evening Star and the Morning Tribune. I don't know which one it was in anymore, but there was a photo of me working on one of those topiaries I was talking about. It was the bill, I was working on the bill. And my department chairman, uh, Father Whalen, uh, journal journalism department, the picture showed up right before the fair. He called me, said, what are you doing? Why aren't you working yet? Because in those days you finished college and you had a job within two weeks. Yeah, I wanted to stay at the fair for another summer. And by next summer, I was back at the fair uh, anyway, and uh, uh, spent a little bit more time in the greenhouse, not much, but in the fall of 77, uh, I went uh, to work in the, uh, it was called Space Rental End, but it's the commercial exhibits department. So it's the, there's about a thousand commercial exhibits. There's another 300 food exhibits. And then I also handled the events that went on year round uh, at that point. It, and it was about, I was nowhere near what we're doing now, but uh, I did that for a year and then starting 1979, I took over what was called a publicity department. Uh, now it's marketing and it's of course, it's much expanded. There, there, there was no internet yet back then when I started. News releases were all done on typewriters and mailed out and now it's, uh, you know, all that works electronically. You flick a switch and it's out there. Uh, I did that for 18 years and saw a lot of change over that time in technology and broadcast and everything. Uh, but then it's it's been my privilege for the last, I'm on my 26th year now uh, as general manager of the fair. And you know, going into things, you'd, you'd never, of course, you'd never dream that you'd do anything this long. But, uh, but uh, here I am, and uh, I'm just glad for the opportunity. Uh, uh, just delighted to have, be able to, to, to serve in this role for, for this long. Uh, when I started in this job, the, the grounds, the fairgrounds, the facilities uh, were in pretty tough shape. A lot of it was built WPA days. Some were even older than that. And, and, uh, and getting the grounds back up to where they needed to be, uh, I knew it was going to take a lot. And we really weren't sure how we were going to get it accomplished, but started the foundation in, uh, within the uh, few years of my starting in this job. And then also we got our, we actually have our own bonding authority, uh, which enables us to do some big projects. And that's what I've been focusing on, you know, among the, there's always the day-to-day -day stuff you have to focus on and you want to provide outstanding customer service. We want to be a good neighbor. We want to do all the right things and work really hard at it. But we also have to see how that's going to play into the future. You know, the fair has been around a long time and I've been there, it seems like forever and it is, it's well over 50 years now. Uh, but in the timeline of the fair, that's still only a fraction, you know, a fraction of that time. The, the fair has been here, it's been this wonderful institution for all this time. And, and we also have to look to the future and, and maintaining that. So number, number one would be 
along with staying relevant and doing doing presentations that mean something to people. You know, if you don't do that, then you quickly become uh, antique and you just don't mean anything anymore. So so we have to we have to stay current. We have to we have to make sure we're reaching everybody. We have to make sure that that all communities are part of the fair and we work really hard at that. But also you can't do any of that if you don't have have the proper facilities. You, you know, you can have the best intentions and a wonderful a program, um, but if you don't have anywhere to do it, or if the facilities are decaying, nah, not so much. You know, it just won't happen. So, we've been big on technology. Uh, uh, in the last 15 years, we have a, an extensive fiber optic network network around the grounds. Lots of things you never see. You know, with all the all the building on the north end uh, and the new north of, end event center, it's only a few years old now. There was no utilities up there, and you know, you just. It, it, it's nice if you're able to do big projects. Oh, let's put it here. Yeah, well, there's always more to the story. And that used to be uh, ag machinery, Machinery Hill during the fair. There, there were no utilities, there's no infrastructure, there's no anything. So all of these things had to be planned out and mapped out moving ahead. But, but I'd say, and, and my time, clearly I've been at this a really long time. So my, my time is winding down. But uh, what I see my most important role now uh, instead of planning the fair's future, what, what I need to do is, is tee it up for the next generation. And that's by developing good young leadership, uh, by doing all the things we talked about, making sure everybody's included uh, through a DEI initiatives and other programs. I mean, we, that, those are the things we need to do and we are doing them right now. And I have all the confidence in the world of our new young staff coming up they're they're outstanding they get it they get what the fair is about they understand our place in the community and uh, they're gonna i know i know they'll they're, they'll do all the right things because they are doing all the right things now so uh, that's a really long answer to a really short question but thanks for your patience <laughs> well we've got just a few minutes left here any last questions feel free to ask You're getting a lot of kudos in the chat. I think this was uh, very well received by everybody, including me. Well, I guess I have one question then. You mentioned the streetcar system. Uh, what was the streetcar access like to the state fairgrounds? Was there, a, was there ever a station or a depot on site or was it just outdoor access? What, what do you know about the streetcar access? Well, most of it was outdoors, but uh, thankfully there are some old photos and, and that was the principal way of getting to the fair until uh, in 1953, the line from Minneapolis was discontinued and in 1954, the line from St. Paul was. The thought then was buses will replace streetcars. And uh, they kind of did, but not really, you know, we, we know how all that evolved, but, you know, I, I talked to my, my, my parents, people of that generation uh, who grew up with streetcars and they were everywhere. You, and, and there's, uh, I don't remember where I found it even, but it's, uh, it, it's part of um, like Google's Twin City streetcars and you get the info. Uh, there was no spot in the Twin Cities more than a block and a half from a streetcar line. They were everywhere. And when you have that kind of transit, it's it's outstanding. Uh, all the garages, there are still some. You know, I'm in I'm in the upstairs of mine that we built, but a lot of the garages in our neighborhood are still single car garages. If people had a car at all, you know, they had one. There weren't multiple cars because there was so much transit; it was so easily accessible. And at the fair, uh, because again, because it's a summer event, it was all outdoors. Uh, and uh, that map I showed you earlier. Uh, it actually, the, all the streetcars stacked up. It went in from Como all the way to the base of the grandstand ramp. Uh, and in 1934, the uh, Aghor, not Aghor, the DNR building, Department of Natural Resources, the, 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 the tracks and the stacking area was shortened uh, and the uh, DNR building was built. But uh, also in 34, they, a new gate was created with that what's called the streetcar arch. Uh, that wound up south of Como uh, in, a, in a, like a, uh, uh, an outdoor catch basin, uh, just a stormwater drain area. And all these plants, and they got moved there in the early 80s and all just the plants, trees, everything grew up around it. And it was basically hidden and forgotten about. 
uh, until we started working on the West End project and the new transit hub. And we said, hey, we got to get that thing back so it's all restored. Again, you know, closing the circle, coming full circle, taking that old streetcar arch from 1934, and now it welcomes guests on the north side, most of whom are arriving by buses. Um, but it, it, the, the old gates, and we have photos of all of the stuff of the old gate and how it worked and how it functioned. Uh, 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 mostly a lack of a roof over the over what was the depot, but you can imagine with so many people coming from uh, uh, the east and the west, uh, just just how much space was required and how popular that was. Well, great, thank you very much. Uh, we are bumping up on our end time here, two thirty. So, Jerry, thank you for being here. This was absolutely fantastic. So much great history today. And uh, I'd like to invite everybody back next Sunday. You know, if you're thinking of springtime and things coming up later this year, uh, the snow is going to melt soon. It's going to be time for gardening. And Ramsey County Master Gardeners will be here to talk about pruning trees and shrubs. And that'll be next Sunday at 1 p.m. here via Zoom. Same link. So if you found this one, you'll find that as well. I put the link to the schedule in the chat to see if there's anything else that might uh, be of interest to you. Uh, hope to see you at that one next week or one in the future. Uh, thanks again for being here, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.